to come on screen and take it away. Thank you so much, James. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerators Investment Forum, presented in collaboration with the Organization of the Eastern Caribbean States. During this morning's event, we will focus on investing in climate resilience in the OECS, and we present an exciting and thought-provoking program to promote opportunities for sustainable development in the Eastern Caribbean. The Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator is a strategic partner of the OECS. We also work across our coalition of 28 countries throughout the Caribbean and South America to achieve our mandate of developing the world's first climate smart zone in the region. We collaborate, we convene, and we match make to accelerate the pace of climate action. We deliver on this mandate by promoting investment ready climate smart projects from the Eastern Caribbean, introducing regional project leaders to our panel of investors, with the aim of establishing and leveraging relationships to further facilitate investment activity and establishing the investment process. Our program this morning will start with a feature address from His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS. This will be followed by a presentation on the climate finance landscape um, by me and then by the presentation of a suite of projects from the OECS by our CEO, Raquel Moses. Raquel will then moderate and invest the panel of climate resilience investors. Our audience members will have the opportunity to have their questions posed to the panel of project leaders and the finance panelists following each of the presentations. So please locate the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and feel free to post your questions throughout the course of the presentations. We will then wrap up with a private fireside chat um, following the end of our live stream. Our fireside chat will be available to our attendees on our Zoom platform only. I now introduce you to Dr. Didicus Jules, who will set the stage for our session this morning. His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS, was recently re-elected re to the position for a third term, having assumed the post of Director General in May 2014. He has worked tirelessly on behalf of the OECS, and we congratulate him on his reappointment. He is responsible for driving the regional integration thrust towards a single economic and social space involving 10 Eastern Caribbean states. Dr. Jules has had a distinguished and multidimensional career focused on education, social transformation, and organizational reengineering. And he has extensive regional and international experience. Dr. Didicus Jules has provided consultancy services to national governments, regional and international organizations in the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, and North America. He's also served on many private sector, educational and philanthropic boards. Dr. Jules holds a Bachelor of Arts degree, a Master of Science degree, a PhD, as well as an MBA from the University of the West Indies. For full information on his bio, please visit our website. And I welcome now His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules. Thank you very much, Sharon. Madam Moderator, Mrs. Raquel Moses, Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. Mr. Jamie McEwney, Head of the Caribbean Advisory Cross Boundary. Mr. Alexia Bain, Managing Partner for Deep Can Impact. Mr. Stephen Weatherburn, Renewable Explorer, Total Energies Market in Jamaica. Ms. Ramsey Issa, Managing Director, Credit Suisse. Mr. Andre Fernandez, co-founder and co-CEO Invest Inc. Mr. Gregory Hill, Managing Director, Ansa Bank Limited. Mr. Chamberlain Emmanuel, Director, Environmental Sustainable Division, OECS. Ms. Judith Ephraim, Program Director, Sustainable Energy. Ms. John, John Novell, Program Director, Biodiversity and Ecosystems Management. Mr. Crispin Dover, Climate Management and Risk Management Coordinator. Commander David Robin, Program Director, Oceans, Governance and Fisheries. 
esteemed and distinguished participants. A warm welcome to the investors, the development partners, the entrepreneurs, and everyone who would have made this event a priority in the face of so many competing priorities and urgencies. We are very thankful for your presence here, and I'd like to start with an explanation of why the OECS. And this why is inextricably tied to who we are. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS for short, is a regional integration movement of 11 small states in the Eastern Caribbean, from the British Virgin Islands in the north to Grenada in the south. Think of us as a mini Caribbean version of the European Union, although sometimes we brag that we, and we think we are a little more successful in that respect. Our membership comprises six independent states and five non-independent territories, three of whom are British and two of whom are French. Our total landmass is 5,893 square kilometers, which makes us small island states. But our maritime space is 2,750,000 square kilometers which makes us large ocean states. Our collective population is 1.5 million, 700,000 of which are Anglophone and 800,000 are Francophone. Approximately 25% of our population is youth, age under 29 years of age. And that speaks to a potential for innovation and appetite for risk and a hunger for success. Our aggregate gross domestic product is 31.7 billion US dollars, but 21 billion US of which is accounted for by the French associate members. Why the OECS? Here are some simple becauses. Because we are among the smallest SIDS, but with or sufficient ocean space to be a unique petri dish for creation of innovations in the integration of green and blue economies. Another because our scale and size makes us an ideal canvas to paint an innovative picture of the possibilities of the smallest beautiful paradigm. There's a relatively low cost investment in prototyping because we are also able to aggregate needs and opportunities to create better economies of scale, but still remain manageable. What are the opportunities? There are three portals of opportunity. One portal are the problems that are intractable obstacles to our ambition that require urgent solution. The second portal is the bigger picture design challenges that align to our climate commitments and targets. And the third are the opportunities that are already being pursued by innovators and creative minds among us. And just to give you a quick span, a quick snapshot of some of these initiatives that fall within these three portals on urgent problems to be solved. One of the major things that we'll be looking at here today would be electric mobility, gas to electric, and go electric public transportation. In the big picture design challenges and ambitions, we already have several instances of uh, exa exemplars in that space. There's the integrated creative economy initiatives, um, best exemplified by Desi Brown of St. Kitts and Nevis with Poise, who's been doing a really creative mix of, of um, dance, uh, event management, marketing, a very interesting mix and blend of these initiatives. There's Tahira Banks of Thoughtful Digital Agency in Anguilla, who is doing the most amazing uh, software app development suited to the needs of small states, but thinking globally in a smaller space as Anguilla. And then we have in the opportunities being pursued, what is probably the best known of the initiatives in the OECS, Joanna and Dujon of Algas, converting Sargassum, which is a huge problem for our beaches, our coastal communities, and our tourism, 
to organic fertilizer. And then there's the solar power initiatives led by Daniel Florius. There's the Project Jaguar in Antigua, online learning solutions being pioneered by Trevon Solomon, who in fact was one of our, our 30 on the 30, they've been all 30 on the 30 entrepreneurs in the OECS and uh, um, participated in our business pitch competitions in the sustainable development movement. And then there's Carib Horizons of Guadeloupe, which is an, um, an amazing networking um, construct that brings together persons working with passion in different areas, but all related to climate and innovation. These are only a few of the innovations that we've discovered in the last three years. The level of innovation in the region demonstrated across the space, especially by the youth, tells a very different story from the tales of disengagement and drift that is the more current lament. Young people in the OECS are making lemonade from lemons. And it is for us to build a future today by blowing beneath their wings and opening up new doors of opportunity. This event today is only the start of a new chapter of partnership with the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. And it exemplifies what the accelerator was designed to do identify opportunities in the digital green, blue, orange, and circular space, make the connections between dreams and possibilities, and help bridge the chasm between great ideas and practical action. The OECS Commission and the Accelerator will be carefully analyzing the outcomes of today's forum so that we can improve future encounters of this nature. This initiative is vitally important to us because we expect that this type of encounter will be an ongoing process with the accelerator. Our focus will span things like geothermal energy advancement, electric vehicle retrofitting, biodiversity and ecosystems management, climate and disaster resilience, and plastic recycling and conversion. The OECS extends its deepest appreciation to the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, and in particular to Raquel, for her passion and commitment to the region. Thanks also to everyone who is participating in this event, which we hope will represent the acceleration of our ambition for resilience, for climate smart future. I thank you all for being part of this, and we really look forward to the results of this really critical event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jules, for your insightful comments. We do share the view that more engagements of this nature are required across the region, and we certainly stand ready to help and support the region in that regard. I will now lead a presentation on climate finance, providing an overview of the options available for financing projects across the region. So this morning I will cover project financing and explore some critical information for determining how we move our projects from idea to implementation and the role that finance plays in helping us achieve those goals. So we're all aware of the core and basic finance mechanisms that are available, not just to projects, but generally for corporate finance. So grant funding, equity, as well as debt financing. And I'll go through in the next few slides um, the basic characteristics of each of these types of financing and how they could be applied to projects. So grant financing, which we all are aware of, um, very popular in the governmental space, is usually provided by NGOs and charitable organizations. 
with a view to funding and supporting projects and is usually provided without the expectation of payback. It typically supports non-commercial projects and early stage projects, providing financial support for things such as proof of concept, feasibility studies, market studies, and technical studies that need to be undertaken to further build out our project ideas and concepts. Grant financing can also be provided for commercial projects to unlock additional capital. The sources of this financing are typically philanthropists, as I said, charities, development finance agencies, governmental and specialized agencies, as well as non-governmental organizations. Next, we have equity financing, typically raised through the sale of shares. And the important concept about equity financing is that it provides the benefit of ownership to persons who acquire equity finance. It usually involves, involves the sale of shares um, in various forms. And those units are retained by the buyers and allows them to have, to some extent, a say in the running of the business. The repayment terms are not fixed, and it usually commands a much higher rate of return to compensate for uncertainty and risk associated with this type of financing. It's usually subordinated to debt, which means that holders of equity finance are repaid last in the stack of um, debtors to the organization. The sources of equity finance to start with are usually the owners of a project who are required to provide capital to establish the entity for the operation of the business or activity. Thereafter, once the business is off the ground and has the ability to generate some commercial returns, players such as angel investors, private equity players um, are able to provide additional support for financing the business. And later on in the life of the business or project, we also see institutional investors coming into play and much later as well, commercial banks and public investors where persons can go to the public capital markets to also provide financing for their projects. Next, we have debt of a concessional nature, which is loans that are usually provided on generous market and below market rates. Concessionality is usually achieved through reduced interest rates and by grace periods for the repayment of those loans. Concessional debt usually supports non-commercial projects such as infrastructure development, social interventions, and public goods. And is usually provided through public financing agencies such as the government financiers, multilateral development banks, and special purpose funds. Then next we have our commercial or private debt, usually provided by commercial banks and other private players. It also comes in the form of short to long-term debt and is provided at prevailing market interest rates required to provide a market return to persons advancing the financing. Commercial debt is usually provided through the normal corporate finance channels or can also be provided through project financing channels, which use no recourse financing to be able to secure the interests of the lenders. Private debt is very much applicable to commercial projects and to established and familiar business models. Players such as commercial banks, for instance, will be more concerned and more risk averse and will therefore be more happier, I would say, they will be happier to provide commercial loans to establish business models. Where we have new and emergent business models, angel investors as well as private equity players are more likely to operate in that segment of the market. And we will find that as projects grow, and achieve the revenues and cash flows that are able to support debt repayments, then institutional investors as well as public investors through the capital markets will also be more interested and inclined to provide financing at that level. 
So what does this mean for us across the region in terms of financing our projects? Looking at the statistics for project finance um, across the world for 2019 and 2020, we found that grant financing was only provided um, in, for 6% of the projects. Of the total percentage of debt that was provided, grant financing was the least used. For us in the Caribbean, where we know that we have high debt burdens across our countries, and that we still have, in many cases, significant work to do in terms of development, as well as adaptation and mitigation to the threats of climate change. The absence of this type of financing provides us with some challenges. While we do have very well established concessional debt players, having to go to the private markets, as well as the rate at which even concessional debt is provided at times can be can prove very challenging for our economies. So we now examine how innovations in climate finance can help us move forward with accelerating funding to our projects. And we start with blended finance. There are several innovations in play right now. Um, crowdfunding along with blended finance, green bonds, blue bonds. We also have debt for nature swaps and natural asset companies. I will give an overview of each of these types of innovations and how they can be applied within the region. So blended finance leverages all the types of finance that we've spoken about so far. It basically creates a stack of financing that uses concessional capital in the form of grants or concessional financing at a low rate or free of cost and combines it with public and other commercial debt to provide financing at a much lower cost of capital. When you take the average of the cost of capital across the various types of financing that is provided, we get financing coming in overall at a much lower rate. Blended finance can be provided through a blended finance instrument where a asset manager or a group of investors has already provided the various types of, in, of financing into the blended finance fund, done the combination, and the overall lending from that blended finance fund will come to project players at a much lower rate of return. Or in the case of a project, if it is sufficiently large, the blending of the sources of finances can be done within the project. Overall, you will have, as I said, a much lower cost of capital that allows you to finance the project and achieve the objectives of the project without the high debt burdens that would typically obtain if you were to go into the traditional markets for financing. Blended finance is typically has been used across the sustainable development goals, but more recently has been applied to the climate finance um, space to be able to support the funding of projects in this area. We work very closely with one of our strategic partners, um, Convergence, who provides support and education in this area and also provides access to information about blended finance deals that are in play across the globe. So that if there are instruments that are available that support the types of projects that we're doing, we're able to provide linkages to those players to support our projects. Crowdfunding is another development that we need to take note of. We've all heard about it in the context of some of the more popular um, crowdfunding platforms but there's also crowdfunding within the climate finance space. And it basically describes the process of persons pooling their financial resources to support specific initiatives or projects. With regard to climate financing, the finance to crowdfunding, sorry, climate finance can be provided in the various forms that we've already discussed. So it can be provided in the form of debt or in equity, based on the structure of the crowdfinancing, crowdfunding platform that is providing the support. Other innovations in the climate finance space include green bonds and blue bonds. 
We've heard a bit about these across the region already, but basically they're bonds for whom the specific purpose has been established for the on lending of the funds. The persons issuing the bonds will go to the capital markets with the intention of raising financing. And then there are some very specific green and blue bond principles that are governed by the International Capital Markets Association that players have to adhere to in order for their financial instruments to maintain the description of a green or blue bond. There is also the necessity to have a third party rater, an agency who has been accredited specifically for that purpose to evaluate the operations of the entities who raise the financing to verify that the funds have been used in accordance to the mandates that were set out when the funds were raised. Debt for nature swaps, also of interest within the region. And I think we may all have heard about the recent Belize debt for nature swap. And prior to that, the Seychelles blue bond initiative that was undertaken. The debt for nature swap is relatively new in implementation, but conceptually has been around since the 1980. It is an agreement that proposes reducing the debt of a developing nation by a buyout by an NGO in exchange for continued investment by the country in conservation or preservation activities. The savings from the reduced debt must be reinvested into the economy and into the country to continue the conservation and preservation efforts. It is a great opportunity for developing countries to reduce their high debt burdens and also simultaneously address the issues of climate change um, that face us. And the final innovation that I'll speak to is natural asset companies. Our strategic partner, the Intrinsic Exchange Group, in conjunction with the New York, New York Stock Exchange, is currently pioneering a new asset class based on natural assets and the mechanism to convert them to financial capital. The basic concept behind this is that we leverage the value of ecosystem services generated from our natural assets, such as land, and we use that to use the value of that to generate revenue for the entity by raising capital on the capital, international capital markets. It requires a robust corporate structure, as well as a strong legislative framework around the ownership of the assets to be able to support the establishment and execution of the operations of these types of companies. While it is a pioneering effort, I think there are many countries within the region where we have opportunities to be able to develop this type of natural asset company and use the ecological services valuation methodology to be able to attract financing for the conservation within the region. So finally, how do we attract investors to our projects knowing all of this? Our first takeaway is that we need to understand our project. There are many mechanisms available across the landscape and we need to be very clear on what our project does, what type of financing it requires based on the stage that it is at and what type of um, entity or venture it will be such as commercial versus non-commercial and make sure that we channel our efforts towards raising finances to the appropriate um, financiers who are out there. So at the most basic level, we must know what stage we're at, what type of financing we're looking for, and match that request to the financiers that are available to us. And how do we as the CCSA support this? In addition to the investor forum, which we're executing today, the second such initiative in our series, we also operate a financial advisory committee that supports our commercial projects with matching with our commercial investors. We do that on a periodic basis by presenting our project briefs to our commercial panel who are heads of 
financial services companies who operate across the region. We also conduct our video and webinar educational series that touches on all of these topics that we've outlined. And in addition to the areas and innovations that have outlined, we also have in development some education on carbon markets and carbon credits that we are fleshing out with the view to bringing that to our stakeholders much later in the year. So at this stage, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to present, and I will now uh, hand you over to Raquel Moses, who will take you through the project pre presentation on behalf of the OECS. She will be joined by the project leads from the OECS, who will be on hand to field questions coming out of her presentation. We have Judith Ephraim, Program Coordinator, Sustainable Energy Unit with the OECS, John, John Norville, Program Director, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Management, Crispin Dovergine, Climate Change and Risk Management Coordinator, Susanna de Beauville Scott, Project Manager, Ocean Governance and Fisheries, and possibly Commander David Robin, Program Director, Oceans Governance and Fisheries. Please post your questions in the Q&A box and we will take a few minutes after the presentation to pose any questions that come up to the panel that's available. Raquel, over to you. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you, uh, Dr. Jules, for your incredibly kind world words about uh, both the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator as well as um, me personally. We really appreciate it having established all of the protocols. Cheryl, if you could please, I need to share screen. Um, we, we really um, are really excited about the opportunity and I'm going to now present to you the projects by the OECS, having, um, having had the chance to engage with the OECS team, we are really, really quite thrilled about the work that they're doing, the excitement in the projects that they've generated and how much work that has gone into where they are today. Um, what is incredibly evident is how hardworking the team is. I just wanna make sure that everybody's, everybody's come on screen, have they? Wonderful. I want to make sure that everyone's on screen and and ready to field any questions. One second for me. There we go. I want to make sure that you can see my screen. Oh, and of course it's not, my screen is not showing one second for me. Let me try one more time. Are you seeing my main screen or my um, presenter screen? You can see the presentation. You can see the presentation, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. All right. So Dr. Jules would have really expertly set the stage, articulating the challenges, vulnerabilities, and opportunities in the OECS. Um, we were recently the nominators for the Earthshock Prize. And what was amazing was not just the number of submissions that we got from the OECS, but the level of innovation. When he talks about uh, the taking lemons and making lemonade across the OECS, we are really seeing a level of innovation in the OECS that is global and um, quite remarkable given the size and the number of people in the OECS. And we're excited about the ability to generate investment in this region, which can only spur more innovation and more investment across the region. So when we take a look at the projects and we're presenting these at a really, really high level because we want to just give you a sense and a taste of what is available and not necessarily to, to share everything with you because if we, we looked at blue economy alone and decided that it really required its own conversation because there are, as, as uh, Dr. Jules pointed out, 
with two two million seven hundred and fifty kilometers worth of of economic activity or economic landscape being covered by the ocean, we are big ocean states, and just having a conversation about that alone would um, would require its own session. So we plan to to follow up this session with a session on blue economy. A lot of investors have been really interested in the blue blue economy space, and we're seeing a lot of innovation in, in terms of the ability to fund the blue economy as well. So today we're presenting twenty five point two million dollars worth of projects across six different projects, um, geothermal energy advancement, the in Eastern Caribbean Solar Challenge, the electric vehicle retrofit that Dr. Jules mentioned as well, the Caribbean Community Resilience Program, the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Management Program, and Recycle OECS. And we'll be opening the floor for questions following this conversation. So on the geothermal energy advancement, if you, um, when you look at the OECS, despite the high cost of, of energy in the OECS, the renewable energy implementation is less than 5%. And what that means is that there's huge opportunity for development. So the Geothermal Energy Advancement Initiative is an umbrella encompassing two core elements. One is the capacity building for utilization and the other one is the development of the geothermal roadmap. Now, several countries within the OECS are at different stages of development. And this project is being led by Judith Ephraim. And we're really um, quite intrigued by it because what we're seeing across the region is that what would have originally looked like a single or, or several different energy markets is beginning to look like one consolidated energy market across the region presenting an opportunity for the Eastern Caribbean to potentially not only develop and fulfill all of its energy needs, but also to be a net exporter of renewable energy through green hydrogen in collaboration with the rest of the region. So as a part of that, building out the geothermal capacity and developing the roadmap as to where this could go, including capacity building for planning, exploration, project management, enhancing policy and legislative and the regulatory environment, knowledge management and public awareness. All of these are critical. And as Dr. Jules mentioned, we really have the opportunity to show how these things can operate at scale by using the OECS as a testing ground, but we will need to invest to get that potential. And so the Geothermal Energy Advancement Project is a key opportunity to do just that. Following on from that, we have the Eastern Caribbean Solar Channel Challenge, and that's led by Crispin Divergne. And the objective in the Eastern Caribbean Solar Challenge is to make sure that we get as much implementation of solar across the region. And so it is aimed at increasing the deployment of renewable energy technologies in support of corporate household, national and regional goals and building climate resilience at the same time. So it focuses on renewable energy uptake, promoting opportunities to take action that demonstrate energy leadership and galvanize the region's efforts to transition to a low carbon economic zone. And this is something that, if, if properly developed, can spur a lot of development over and above just this challenge. And so we're excited about the potential that this challenge presents to develop, looking at how we, how we fulfill our renewable energy potential in the Eastern Caribbean. The electric vehicle retrofit. Now, this is something that is really quite important and something that no one has yet figured out. How do we transition to renewable energy at scale uh, and decarbonize transportation? And this one is, we are going to need to retrofit vehicles because we don't have the potential to just replace all of the vehicles. Yes, there's natural attrition that's going to take place, but as that natural attrition takes place, there will also be a large group of vehicles that need to be retrofitted in order to be to transition to, to EVs. 
And this is how do we how do we make that transition? What kinds of policies and incentives do we put in place? What does that look like um, at scale? And not just across one country, but across several countries and across a region, across countries that are sovereign states, as well as countries that are overseas territories. And so this allows us to look at this at a different perspective across the globe and solve a problem that everyone needs to solve to decarbonize transportation. The next project that we're looking at is the Eastern Caribbean Community Resilience Program. And what we would have, both Cheryl and Dr. Jules would have talked about is the fact that we need to build resilience. We're seeing a lot of investment in climate mitigation, but not enough in climate um, adaptation. And we are going to need to build resilience in our communities in order to make this, um, to transition and to meet the goals that we have set. So the member states have to protect themselves and build resilience against re extreme weather events. The project focuses on three core objectives, enhancing human and in institutional capacity, to empirically identify and respond to community led level hazards, support the implementation of targeted engineering, ecosystem based and socioeconomic interventions aimed at reducing community vulnerability and increasing resilience while protecting and enhancing associated livelihoods and supporting awareness building and the sharing of lessons learned and best practices. And by doing that, we not only create resilience, but we build capacity and we share best practice and we learn from what can be done. I mean, it's one thing to, to build resilience, but it's another thing to empower communities to determine what resilience means to them and how that should move forward to protect them. The next project is the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Management Program. And this one is particularly um, exciting for us because it aims to provide credible, legitimate, and relevant evaluation of the current knowledge on biodiversity and ecosystem services at the country level. I know that uh, some of the countries are already engaged in doing this assessment, but we need to have this assessment done across the board. And it's something that, again, once contemplated and executed in the Eastern Caribbean, we have the ability to start rolling this out globally as to how ecosystem management and valuation should be done. So we, in doing so, we build recognition of biodiversity and ecosystem services as key components of natural capital and how they contribute towards climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as building disaster resilience. In each of these programs, we expect short, medium, and long-term results to help us in determining the effectiveness of these programs. And then finally, the Recycle OECS Plastic Recycling and Conversion Program, which seeks to set up a circular economy program. And in that, we're seeing a lot of excitement and innovation, <clears throat> forgive me, in in the region around um, plastic recycling, conversion and circular economy, including opportunities that can become commercialized. And we'd like to see, again, in the OECS at scale, commercializing the ability to recycle and using those recycled objects into higher value um, end products. So this will enable the OECS to learn from and scale off the successes of programs that they already have running. And so that gives you just a really high level snapshot of the investment opportunities in the Eastern Caribbean. And we're hoping that this is enough to sort of pique your interest so that we can continue the conversation and pair these opportunities with potential investors. Cheryl, over to you. Thank you, Raquel. All right. uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Oh, fabulous, okay. 
Um, let's take the question on geotherm geothermal for Dominica. Okay, great. So the question is, let me see. All right, let's see. There's a geothermal project. No, ah, Farah Theodore. Here in Dominica, there's a geothermal project that has existed for about a decade now. Millions of dollars spent, no real progress, and general confusion around the public for fears of man-made tremors. Do we, how do we address the supervision of these projects, accountability, and access to information? More importantly, a reliable agency to undertake environmental impact assessments. So I can't speak to the environmental impact assessment, but I will say that as it relates to geothermal in the Eastern Caribbean, in Dominica specifically, a lot of progress has been made. If anything, and again, this is me speaking out of turn, there may be a, a PR challenge. Um, we have been able to, we've tracked all of the geothermal projects across the region. And the one in Dominica has had significant progress. So I will invite Judas to come on and share any other details about that project. But I know that um, we are speaking to the investors who are involved and it is looking like you should be at production capacity by next year. Geothermal takes long. We've worked with um, Iceland as well and they've taken us through their process. The, the important part is making sure that the public is aware of the progress that is being made. So Judith? Thank you, Raquel, and good day to um, all our participants. And thank you very much for this question. I think it's a very important one. And Raquel, I think you have you know, already answered a, a big part of the question. Yes, we've made significant progress in Dominica when we look at you know, where we were a couple of years ago. I think um, the fact that we have a functioning geothermal company, um, plants are in place, the plants have been revised and they've been, you know, realistic in terms of what we are hoping to achieve. And I think progress is happening. It is a little slower, but I can see that there is real progress happening in Dominica as in the other countries. Um, and with regard to the environmental aspects, yes, this is very important. And as you said, I think there needs to be a little more sharing of information so that persons in the public can understand what has happened, what steps are being taken to ensure that the environment is being protected, that you know, communities are being protected. Um, currently, the OECS Commission is working um, with the um, Regional Council of Guadeloupe and a few other partners to really develop guidelines for environmental assessment of our geothermal projects. Because we recognize that those projects are very important, but they are normally situated in very sensitive areas. Um, areas of high biodiversity, areas of high environmental integrity. And so we want to maintain a balance and ensure that when they are developed, they are developed in a way that is coherent with our environmental guidelines. Um, they provide the economic um, benefits, but they are also done in a very responsible manner. But as you indicated, the public information and sharing is important. And we are hoping that the GeoBuild initiative that was um, alluded to earlier on, will also provide a, a strong, will also provide strong support for this, really helping to demystify geothermal and ensure that the respective publics get the information that they need to understand, appreciate, and you know, accept geothermal as the way forward, as a way forward for us. All right. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, the next question actually is for us from Jonathan Barkant. Now, this wasn't meant to be about our project specifically, but Jonathan, I will answer your project. Has the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator facilitated funding yet for any projects or companies in the Caribbean? Yes, we have. So we've done, um, we funded a, a mangroves project in Belize. We funded a bioplastics project in Jamaica. We funded a eco, eco tourism project in Jamaica. Uh, but above and beyond that, we have uh, brought two projects to funding, which we haven't, directly participated in, which is Solar Assembly in Trinidad and Tobago, and another plastics recycling project in Jamaica. In, a, in addition to that, we facilitated over 200 connections between uh, either private private sector or private public sector, where we hope that there is more to take place. 
we are focused on um, bigger uh, opportunities. And while we don't necessarily focus on bringing funding specifically to companies, we seek to pair companies with opportunities. Where we're seeing a really great sort of throughput is focusing on opportunities to get funding from large corporates to um, entrepreneurs and innovators. And that is where we're seeing sort of a, a sweet spot of our ability to connect and provide access to funding. The next question I see is, um, Dan Cheryl, great to see different types of investment in the levels of due diligence and corporate structure and scale needed at each level. Oh, that was just a, a comment by Caitlin that it's a, that it provides um, some great context. Great stuff. Um, 10 acres of land to develop a housing project. Um, what is the procedure to get technical support and project financing or an investor if possible? So uh, Cheryl would have talked about our financial advisory committee. And you can go to our website, CaribbeanAccelerator.org and click on con contact us. And in that form, you can provide us with the information on your project that would help to identify um, whether we have sources of funding that we can match you with. Um, are we supporting investment in advanced technologies, allowing to screen soil for gold mines or other kinds of mining materials? For improved agriculture. So we're doing a lot of climate smart agricultural projects. These, these projects were supposed to be for the UECS, but we're doing a lot of climate smart agriculture projects um, in Jamaica, in Anguilla, in uh, Trinidad, two projects, and, and in Bermuda. And that is once again, pairing the entrepreneurs with uh, either private sector partners who are willing to support those projects and move them forward. How much of the geothermal project has been de-risked and what sort of capital is it attracting? That one's for you again, Judith. Um, I'm assuming that they may be speaking specifically to the project in Dominica. Um, I can't speak um, with too much authority on this particular um, business model. I do know that um, they've been quite innovative in terms of um, attracting their funding. Um, so in terms of the specifics for this project, um, we may probably need somebody from Dominica to respond to that. But I just wanted to point out that there are a number of um, facilities currently open. Now I know the Caribbean Development Bank, for instance, they do have a GeoSmart. And I think that the government of Dominica would have, you know, explored a number of options available to them to enable them to get the best fit for their project. All right, so another question for you, Judith, on the Community Resilience Program, and they're asking about how to, what are your plans to measure community resilience? So to talk a little bit about what, what are the measurements you'd like to um, use in measuring it. And I will hand this one over to my colleague, Crispin, who's the lead on this. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. I'm happy to answer the question, but... I think it would, it would vary according to the community and, and according to the project. Um, for example, if you're implementing, say, a, a, a drainage project, you would like to think that the next time that you, know, you have a, an extreme rainfall event, that the, you know, that the flooding, the level of flooding is reduced. So, you know, so that's one of the measures that you would use. If it's a livelihood project, you would say if you're working in, say, um, say fishers or, you know, or, or persons you know, doing you know, ecotourism in the mangrove, you would, you would judge it based on the number of persons employed and you know, the, 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 you know, whether the, the, the standard of living has increased, whether they've been able to sustain over a period of time. So it would have to be bespoke. I mean, you know, customized according to the particular project. But that's an interesting point, Crispin, and, and something that we have worked on as well that we launched last year at COP26, working with the Islands Resiliency Action Challenge, is a resilience scorecard where for each of the uh, countries that are currently being piloted at the moment, five, we're looking at how do they measure resilience because each country and even each community would measure resilience in its own way. And it is about sort of using empirical measures to determine how resilient are they against their own objectives and then scoring that so that a philanthropist, for example, that's looking at water security or um, food security can then take a look across a cross sector of projects 
and then make a decision as to how to support. Um, I see a request. Uh, fabulous. So I'm seeing some other really great questions, but I think we've run out of time on the um, Q&A. Yes, we're, we're beyond time. So um, we'll go now to the, to the um, investor panel. All right. Okay. So in order to do that, any, other, any of the other questions, what we'll do is we'll, we'll answer those offline. I really want to thank all of the uh, project panelists for participating. And then we'll go straight into the, um, the investor panel. All right. So I'd like to introduce first Jamie McInerney. Jamie, are you on screen? Wonderful. Um, Alexa Blaine, Stephen Wedderburn, and Andre Fernandez. Fabulous. So we have we have all of all of our, our panelists on, on screen. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to just provide us with an overview of your, your investment objectives. Okay, and I'm gonna start with, with Jamie. So to introduce yourself and your company, you can find the detailed bios on the page that you use to register, which is on our website, but we would really love it if you could just provide us with your investment objectives. Yeah, you bet. And thank you uh, to everyone uh, at CCSA for, for organizing this. This is, this is a great discussion. Um, so Jamie McInerney with, with Cross Boundary. I'm the head of our Caribbean advisory practice. Um, I also work in some of our business development work globally. Um, we are a, a mission-oriented firm to bring access to capital to what we describe as frontier and underserved markets. Um, and there's two primary ways we do that. We make we raise funds, investment vehicles, and make direct investments. Um, it, uh, along certain uh, very kind of specific criteria and, and investment theses. And then we also, in a much broader um, way, do investment advisory work. So working with either um, capital seekers or investors to either raise capital or deploy capital um, in frontier and underserved markets. So we're about 160 people globally uh, living and working in, in the markets in which we operate. Fabulous. And our, our objectives are, are uh, yeah, to, to have impact as well as commercial return, um, impact measured by any of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. All right. Next, Alexa. Hi, uh, good morning, or at least it's morning where I am. Uh, my name is uh, Alexa Blaine. I'm co-founder and managing partner of Deetkin Impact. Uh, we are an impact investment fund manager. Uh, we manage several funds, uh, but one of uh, our key verticals is sustainable energy. And in fact, we manage two funds to focus on uh, accelerating the renewable energy transition in the Caribbean basin. Um, those funds are called the Honduras Renewable Energy Financing Facility and the Caribbean Basin Sustainable Energy Fund. And both of those funds place emphasis on um, small and medium-sized projects that often face uh, barriers to raising capital. We provide uh, flexible financing, which can be in the form of equity or mezzanine instruments, um, as well as uh, technical assistance support to accelerate more projects to, to financial close. Um, we currently manage about 150 million US, um, about half of which is invested in sustainable energy. We have a team of, of 25. Uh, I'm based in, in Vancouver, Canada, but the majority of our team uh, are in uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Costa Rica, and, uh, and Jamaica. Thanks. Fabulous, thank you. Stephen Wedderburn. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, just quickly to introduce, uh, well, I'm Stephen Wedderburn, a renewable explorer at Total Energies. Now, Probably not many people in the OECS or the wider Caribbean know of Total Energies, and those who do probably know us by our former name of Total, you know, which is one of the world's largest oil and gas companies. But the reason for our new name is to emphasize the fact that we are far more than oil and gas. Uh, we are, in fact, quite a significant provider of renewable energy right now. Uh, we have a we own renewable capacity of more than 10,000 megawatts 
And we also own some leading uh, providers of solar uh, panels and battery and energy storage systems. Many people will have heard of a company called SunPower. That is one of our companies uh, in the solar PV market and SAFT in the battery and energy storage. Now, we are here as probably a new class, uh, equity. We are squarely in the equity investment side because we want to take ownership positions in renewable projects as the Caribbean and the OECS drives you know, for more energy resilience. As I mentioned, we currently have about 10,000 megawatts of renewable energy generating capacity. Our objective is to ramp that up to 35,000 megawatts by 2025 and to 100,000 megawatts by 2030. What that means is that we are looking, actively looking for projects all over the world, including the Caribbean. Our aim is to be one of the largest, one of the five largest suppliers of renewable energy by 2030. Now, as I say, we want to invest in projects. Our, our mode is ownership. You know, we are willing to do projects uh, totally owned. But in the Caribbean, we are looking more to joint ventures and partnerships. So what we would do is take a, a stake, an ownership stake in a project along with a local partner in order to, you know, help that project to go forward. Uh, what we bring is because we are such a strong uh, company, you know, once we are involved in a project, we, you know, the financing issues become much less, you know, it, it, you know, just our presence in a project will make it easier to finance, um, as well as the fact that we are able to provide development assistance uh, in the early stage operation of projects. So, as I say, you know, people think of us as oil and gas, but we want to be seen as an investment partner in driving for energy res resilience in the Caribbean. All right. And Andre. Yeah, thank you, Raquel, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, and thank you for having me. So obviously, I'm Andre Fernandez, CEO uh, of Invert Inc. And having been born in Dominica and raised in Antigua, uh, the Caribbean is really, really close to my heart. And I say this today not because of the beautiful beaches or the great lifestyle and amazing people. Um, I say this because I've experienced the terrible effects of hurricanes firsthand. And I've actually lost my, my home numerous times over the years. Mm -hmm. And so we know today that hurricane, hurricane frequency and intensity is increasing due to global warming. So from the very highest level, our investments at Invert must help scale a solution to climate change. And if projects don't meet this objective, we, we simply will not invest. In addition to that, we invest in projects with the objective of getting a healthy return on our money. Because simply put, if our shareholders can expect healthy returns, they will be more willing to invest in, in people and projects uh, moving into the future. And so the more that we can raise and deploy the more that we can uh, you know, help to accelerate these solutions to climate change. Um, and then lastly, we also look to projects that can demonstrate and deliver social impacts to local communities. And so all things equal, if a project uh, you know, delivers social impact to a local community, we will invest in that project over, uh, over another project. So to sum it up, it's really three things. It must scale a solution to, to climate change. Um, it must deliver healthy returns to shareholders. And uh, last but not least, must deliver social impacts to lo local communities. All right, thank you so much. You know, I, I wanted to, to sort of start with you, Andre, and then, and then move, move backwards in the questions. Um, but can you, can you give us an... Uh, an example of, of a project. So you, I know it has to scale, it has to have a healthy return and it has to deliver social impact. Can you give us an example so that we have something that's a little more uh, tactile to work with? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, when we think about nature-based projects, for example, and, uh, you know, some people might call the Caribbean small island states, but we like to call them big ocean states. And so a natural example of, of one of these projects 
would be a blue carbon project or you know a mangrove project where essentially you can uh, you can conserve or you can restore a wetland area and, and plant um, mangroves. And so ultimately what you could do is you can um, you can conserve, restore these mangroves and, and sell carbon offsets as a mechanism to attract capital or, or the financing to, to implement the project. And so from what I've seen, these projects are very productive when it comes to generating carbon offsets. And at the same time, they, you know, they deliver social impacts because the local community are typically the groups who do the planting and the conservation and the work surrounding the project. And ultimately we know that if you can, you know, if you can reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, or if you can sequester greenhouse gases as you can with blue carbon or, or mangroves, then uh, it, it is addressing or helping to scale a solution to climate change. So that would be an example of a project that meets all three, uh, three criteria that we would invest in. Okay, great. That's a that's a really great example. Stephen, coming back to you, and you 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 did give us a lovely example, which is great. But this this um, hundred thousand megawatts by twenty thirty is it is is an extraordinary yes, right. goal. I mean, you know, yes, I appreciate um, equity investments or joint ventures, but how do you anticipate getting there, given the way that we are currently? Um, proceeding along the trajectory of, you know, we've we've had barely single into double digit growth, early double digit growth in terms of the implementation of renewables across the region. So how do you see getting to that kind of, of, of growth in the short term? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And remember, you know, 100,000 megawatts, it's worldwide. So although we okay. are small in the Caribbean, um, you know, but, I mean, the, growth, the, the growth everywhere else is 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 challenging as well. Right. It's not just us. But let's talk about the Caribbean in terms mm. of how you see us getting there. Right. Yes. OK. All right. Now, and what is interesting, you know, because normally we are obviously pursuing some very big projects. One of our strengths is in offshore wind. And we are involved in a number of very large offshore wind projects. You know, the sea wind project in the UK, which I think is about 3,100. Mm -hmm. uh, megawatts. Um, we have just been selected to do a, a 4,000 megawatt offshore wind project in the US. But so normally we would operate at a scale which is bigger than the Caribbean, but we are mm -hmm. also doing projects which are more relevant to the Caribbean. We have just in the last couple of weeks announced final investment decision on the EOLMED offshore floating wind project in France, mm -hmm. and that is a 30 megawatt uh, offshore uh, wind project. Uh, you know, we are involved with two other partners. And so it's a model of how we would see ourselves operating in the Caribbean, you know, partnerships. And, you know, a 30 megawatt project is something that, you know, could, can work in, a, in the Caribbean. So, you know, so I do stress that what we are looking for is uh, equity partnerships. You know, we do want an ownership stake, but we also believe that we can help those people who are trying to develop projects in the Caribbean because we bring the strength uh, to, you know, make your projects reality. You know, sometimes I think because of a lack of capital in the Caribbean, we tend to focus and keep our objectives tiny. Mm. But if you have a partner like uh, Total Energies, you can really aim big, you know, and yeah. All right. So... Uh one last sort of follow-up question to that. So have you have you prepared sort of a forecast as to how you plan to get to the goal? All right, no, okay. Um, all right, well, we haven't publicly done a, an overall Caribbean mm -hmm. uh, strategy yet. Mm -hmm. We are in the process of developing that. Um, you know, I am a renewable expert at Total Energies. There are about 60 people like me across the world you know, at Total Energies. Mm -hmm. uh, so all looking at that, we th this network was set up in last September. So, you know, still fairly new. Okay. My, my, uh, my focus is the CARICOM market. And so, you know, I will be looking at, you know, looking to develop strategies for CARICOM market. But at this point, I'm still in a sort of in the introductory stage, like, sure. you know, letting people here know that we are around. But, you know, certainly within the next year, we actually want to start getting our feet wet in actual projects. 
Fabulous. So what we can do is we can help you to build out our forecast across our our countries and and with uh, the entrepreneurs that we're working on with Protex. So that's a it's a great answer that is not done yet. We still have an opportunity to to weigh in. So Alexa, again, it would be great for you to provide specific examples of projects. So where are you seeing the role of of entrepreneurship? in this build out. And, you know, we know that you guys have been one of the more successful funds in terms of funding some of the renewable energy projects. So to talk to us about um, how you've been able to be so, so successful and, and what are some of the things that you've seen? Sure, so, I mean, maybe I'll talk about the example of the Caribbean Basin Sustainable Energy Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a fund that's just under 30 million US dollars and it was launched in, in 2018. And um, I can say that from, the LP side of the limited partner investors in our fund, I think there was um, some caution that, that that amount of money could be successfully deployed in the Caribbean. And I think the, the, the CABF, what we call it, um, mm -hmm. has been, uh, you know, has proven that, that the pipeline exists. Yeah. The fund is now close to 90% uh, deployed. Uh, we're still within the original investment period of the fund, despite, you know, that there was a pandemic in there, um, and and we've done it by really focusing on working with um, with with local sponsors and focusing on small and medium sized projects, and really bringing an attitude of flexibility um, to to getting the projects done. So that means um, first creative structuring solutions. So one of the things that that we've been sort of piloting in the Caribbean is bundling together smaller projects and offering mm. kind of a line of credit for sponsors that they can draw down as they secure new clients. This would be in a distributed generation or you know, CNI context so that they can draw down, do a project and then draw down again and do the next one. And really the idea here is to create serial project sponsors, right? Mm. That learn as they go and they, by the time they've done their third or fourth or fifth or sixth project, uh, they really know um, how to get projects across the finish line. And I think the other thing that's been really helpful is, um, you know, that we're focusing on on these smaller projects. And I mean, the huge utility, uh, you, you know, utility scale grid connected projects are really important to the transition, right? And and mm -hmm. some of the projects that Stephen was mentioning, like these are truly enormous, and and those are going to be critical. But these large projects can also tend to get bogged down in the procurement process, in regulatory issues, in permitting, in social and environmental uh, licensing, right? Smaller projects can sometimes be more benign uh, from an environmental and social context, and therefore they face fewer barriers to getting to getting finished, right? Uh, but but what is important there is that the sponsor of these smaller projects still has the experience necessary to get it done, and that's where we've really found that um, blended finance structures are important. So where we're bringing technical assistance and capacity building alongside our capital to help sponsors de-bottleneck projects um, so that when, you know, investment ready means different things to different people. And, and for us, if a project has a few gaps in, you know, before it's going to be able to get to successful commercial operations, we try and bring in the resources necessary to close those gaps um, and, and really um, uh, try and bring an attitude of creativity and um, proactivity to the, to the deal. So, you know, you talked about, um, okay, yes, the, the, um, the utility scale projects can be bogged down, but when you say small and, and bundling together smaller projects, give us a size, sense of the scale of the smaller projects that you'd be bundling together for an opportunity, for example. Some can be very small, um, you know, 200, 200 kilowatts, 500 kilowatts, um, certainly less than a megawatt, uh, but we look to get them up to, you know, the kind of, a scale where we can be investing between one and six million dollars of equity mm -hmm. and that and that's that's sufficient for us as an investor and I think and for most investors yeah okay great and Jamie Yes, to provide us with with some some um, some tangible examples would be really really great and some of the stuff that you're seeing in the market would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, I mean, um, I actually think <laughs> everything Alexa said, I fully agree with. And um, that, yeah, that really kind of uh, <laughs> is almost exactly what what I what we see in the market, both with companies we're working with to raise capital and um, with with investors. Um, one just very tangible example is a, is a solar company that we're working with in Haiti. Um, mm -hmm. 
which uh, is obviously quite a challenging market, but is through the approach described, not working on, you know, industrial or I'm sorry, not working on grid scale projects, but really more on the CNI scale um, with large users and off takers, which is really where the Haitian market is already. Um, very, very few people will rely on the grid at all. Um, and so just we're really working to replace diesel with, with large, uh, you know, solar, usually plus storage, sometimes hybrid systems um, for, for, you know, large to medium sized businesses in Haiti. We've seen a lot of uh, investment flow into that area uh, and, and very specifically also recently with the removal of the diesel fuel subsidy in Haiti there's just an extremely clear market signal to switch from diesel. Um, so it's a, it's a very, yeah, like live investment opportunity where again, make commercial returns, but, but also have quite a large impact uh, on the country. All right, and for all of you, notwithstanding the, the you know, and, and I really appreciated your perspective, Jamie, and certainly your perspective, Alexa, um, and, and uh, Stephen and Andre, but I think, as much as, and for renewable energy especially, we can see a lot of ebbs and flows. I know that we're seeing a lot of, of uptake, but if we look at the uptake of the investment required against the objectives that have been set and the pace that we need to be operating at in order to meet our end objectives by 2030, as an example, we're not nearly there, not, not necessarily the level of capital required, not necessarily the investment required. You know, I saw um, there are billions of dollars that are, that, are that are missing to close the gap. And in the region, especially grant funding, which is not what I'm asking about. But what are some of the things that we can do to help to get this to expedite, to expedite this transition to renewables? What are some of the things that we can do um, whether it's the enabling environment, whether it is more philanthropy, what are some of the things that we can do? I'm happy to jump in on that one just, mm -hmm. just quickly. And I think actually what, what you all are doing is, is very much helpful. Um, our experience generally is that there is a lot of capital specifically for, for climate finance looking for homes and it's mm -hmm. lack of investment opportunities, which is the barrier. Um, and so organizations and firms that, that work with companies to, to prepare them, to structure them, um, to approach capital providers is extremely important, really just developing pipeline. Um, a lot of instances, some of the investors that we work with, some of the impact investors we work with are, you know, based in, in Europe or, or in the US and don't just don't get to the, these places uh, where they're seeking to invest very often. So, they rely on advisors um, and 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 yeah, initiatives like yours to, to help kind of tee up opportunities. Um, so yeah, I think that that's one of the and and sort of pairing that with um, I think was mentioned and I know convergence is on the line um, with blended finances is is I think yeah the way to get to scale quickly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just pick up and follow. You know, fully agree with Jamie. Um, you know, the the funny thing is there is. Today, a lot of capital looking for the types of projects you are talking about. And the companies like myself that want to invest. But as Jamie says, the problem is we are not finding the projects uh, to invest in. So it points to the fact that it's really on the, the project preparation side, you know, uh, sponsors identifying opportunities, uh, making them available. Yeah, uh, you know, at the scale at which uh, total energies would be comfortable operating it often be, it's really utility scale and it we often depend on governments uh to uh set the time frame for that you know we can't just come in and do a utility scale project in the caribbean it's a government that sets us up and and really the frustrating part of it for us is that all over the caribbean you know it is sort of in a what i would call a state of slow motion you know in terms of getting things ready to accept the in you know the investment uh, capital that is really available um you mentioned ebbs and flows and that's probably more a regional thing because if you look at it globally and the iea international energy agency just put out a report showing that notwithstanding covid 
you know, notwithstanding wars and supply chain problems, this year for the first time, uh, renewable energy is expected to add, you know, over 300 uh, thousand megawatts or 300 gigawatts of capacity for the first time ever. Um, so, so worldwide, the renewable energy industry continues to grow, notwithstanding the problems. In 2019, we were still below 200,000 megawatts. So, you know, from 200,000 megawatts in 2019 to over 300,000 this year, you can see that there's growth in the market. But in the Caribbean, though, there isn't that growth. And as I say, a lot of it has to do with governments, regulators, uh, project sponsors, getting projects in order to ready to receive investment. I'm going to let Alexa answer and then I'm going to um, share my own own views on on this sort of eventual situation. But Alexa, please. All right. I'll, I'll be brief because I want to hear your views. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I agree um, with both Jamie and Stephen that the, the, the capital is there, certainly. Um, but I think the amount of it that's um, actually willing to take risk alongside the sponsor is very, very limited. I think the projects are also there, um, but you know, it takes capital to get a project to the state at which mainstream finance, domestic banks are willing to, to finance it. And I mean, you know, even for a solar project, which is the lowest kind of technical risk, um, uh, and you know, you need to go buy a piece of land, you need to negotiate an interconnection agreement, you need to go find a PPA, you need to get through all the permitting and licensing. And until you do all that, people say it's not investment ready. And so you need a partner that's willing to help you through those steps and to get to the point at which, yes, lots of capital is available. I think that's really where the bottleneck is happening. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, but I think what we're seeing is that there's a huge mismatch between the kind of funding that we require and the kind of funding that's available. Um, we've done some landscape analysis. We've had a number of uh, different <clears throat> partners look at, you know, when we, you, you, when we reach out to sources of funding or investors who are interested in this space, they're like, send us more projects, send us more projects, send us more projects. And we'll have a long list of projects, but none of them are quite ready for that stage of capital. And I think it is that, you know, as Cheryl had pointed out, that 6% of philanthropy, uh, you know, of all of the, the climate finance, that there really needs to be a lot more uh, philanthropy to help to get projects to the stage where they can attract private capital. I also think that using things like uh, blended finance is an opportunity for us because a lot of the capital, even as you guys have pointed out, are looking for commercial returns. If you have a solid project that has great commercial returns, there is no end of money chasing that project. It is how do we get more projects to that stage where you have the ability to attract the commercial capital. And Stephen, one of the, the, the reasons that we want to make sure that we have regional players, notwithstanding Total's sort of global presence, is that we want to make sure that, that regional institutions get a chance to participate as well. Because once the project is all you know, nicely tied in a bow, we want some of that return to sort of reinvigorate our own environment. And so we need to see that, that sort of project literacy to help to get the projects to the state where they can attract, um, they can attract commercial capital. And, and how do we get more projects sort of properly identified as to what they need to be able to attract that commercial capital? So that would be my, my take on it, although I'm supposed to be asking the questions and not answering them. Um, right. No, no, no problem. <laughs> and just to well, and just to pick up on a couple of things you said about you know regional involvement. And remember, I keep stressing our preferred mode of operation in the operating in the Caribbean is partnerships and joint ventures. So, um, so really, we want to come in and work with people who are already in the region um, to ensure that you know it's not just our project, but that we are working in partnerships. And Alexa mentioned, you know, the involvement of capital at the early stage where, you know, you really don't have a lot of details and you need to get uh, things ironed out so that you can then go to a financing institution. And I said, the important thing of a 
the presence of a company like Total Energies in the market is that we can bring that early stage involvement because we are willing to jump into projects at the early stage. Well, that's good, but but and and you and I will take some of that offline because I want to understand how early is early. Right. There's early and then there's early. There's like embryonic and then there's zygote. <laughs> right. Yes. So, so it'd be great for us to understand um, understand where we are on on Total's ability to get involved in the early stage. But the next question for you, Andre, we're seeing, especially coming out of COP twenty six. Um, a lot of private sector sort of taking a leadership role in set it, in reaching the goals, you know, coming out of the Paris Agreement. And it'd be interesting to get, you know, your take on, on how do you feel about that? Do you think that's the right thing? Do we need more, more public sector action? And certainly a follow-up question to that is, you know, you're working in, in natural systems um, you know, mangroves and, and, and blue carbon. Tell us about a little bit about that market and how you see that developing uh, globally. Yeah, for sure. So I think that COP26 uh, served as a wake-up call for both private and, and public sector. Um, of course, uh, being in, in uh, the private sector, um, maybe my, my view is a little bit uh, biased, but um, what I would say is, even though the, you know, the private sector is considered responsible for accelerating climate change, it cannot be solely responsible for solving it. And I think that even today, shareholder pressure is creating a positive shift in the way that corporations are conducting themselves and rethinking their environmental footprint. But the need for government relations and oversight is becoming clearer. Um, and I think that all branches of government have a role to play in reducing emissions. Um, and the Paris Agreement alone seems incapable of holding governments to account. Um, as and, and you know, I would I would love to uh, you know to hear opinions on this, but I believe that unfortunately we're currently in a system that is dominated by short-term policymaking. Mm -hmm. So based on this. I believe that governments should be addressing climate change for what it is today. And that's a true crisis. And I think too many leaders worldwide have yet to grasp the devastating outcomes of not being more aggressive in tackling this issue. And nations really need to embrace the idea that investing in sustainable practices and regulations will significantly um, reduce costs and provide much more economic benefits in the long term. So all this to say, I believe that governments need to do more to create more ambition or yeah, more ambitious and uh, I guess ambitious emissions reduction targets and to incentivize more sustainable business practices while continuing to, you know, to foster innovation and to strengthen and build upon um, existing measures and regulatory frameworks. So then <clears throat> getting to the, you know, the carbon side of things or the nature-based um, project or solution side of things, um, I think you know, trying to be specific to the Caribbean, one of the challenges that I've seen is that entrepreneurs or you know, project developers are missing the you know, the carbon market or the, the carbon market mechanism to attain financing or to attract capital. And so at Invert, we are hyper-focused on, on carbon markets. And so for us to invest, each project needs to have this carbon component to it. And so I think, you know, if there's one thing that I can get across to the people on this, on this webinar, um, if, if you're developing a project in the Caribbean, and you're looking for, you know, you're looking to attract capital, and it is a nature-based project, then please include a, a carbon component to it, because that is absolutely one way of attracting capital to these projects. And, and today across, you know, various markets, um, nature-based solutions or nature-based projects or the offsets that are generating, generated from these projects are sold with a premium. Uh, to, to other offsets. So I believe that, um, you know, working on nature-based projects can deliver both meaningful 
um, impacts to, to climate and, and climate change and uh, to financing projects and getting them off the ground. Thank you so much. And I, I absolutely agree, agree with you. And I think you're right. It has been it has been a wake up call. You know, I've been looking at some of the questions because as we move into sort of the question and answer portion, there's a fair amount of frustration in the uh, in the, the Q&A about um, where things are. And, uh, you know, you're saying one thing that you said that really struck me is, you know, governments need to set more aggressive targets. But when we talk about governments, who are we talking about? Aren't we talking about us? Aren't we government? Aren't we the ones who elect the people who then set the targets? So, you know, I think if, if there's anything that I'd want to ask each of you is, you know, what what do we want to do differently? What do we want to do differently to, to be able to have a different experience? And just to sort of piggyback on your point, Andre, and I'm going to ask you for a different point, um, but, but the, the fact of, of using carbon markets, I think that's something that's absolutely nascent in the region that we now need to take advantage of. That is a huge, um, huge opportunity to, to create new sources of revenue. And in the region, what we need to do is to find new sources of revenue to fund and close the gap between where the projects are and where they can attract commercial funding. So I'm gonna start with, with you, Jamie, but what, what do you wanna do differently to help us to kind of close these gaps or, or what's possible in, in new and different thinking to, to close some of these gaps? Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of the chat about people. Seems like, I mean, and I agree with this. There's a lot of demand for like project preparation funding, um, and that does exist. Um, and it and and there are advisors that that kind of help with that stage of projects as well. Um, one <clears throat> I've worked with a little bit is the Rocky Mountains Institute um, Energy Island Energy Program, um, yeah. which some of you may have heard of. Um, they're they're know, a partner of ours and we work really closely with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. they're great. Um, and so, so yeah, th that that does exist. I agree. There's uh, and I think Alexa mentioned this also. There's a there's a need for that that level um, of sort of advisory and and sort of risk taking. Um, you know, everything from structuring it correctly, making sure that you know PPAs are successfully negotiated and include the cost of financing um, and um, and you know, you know, the, the front end studies are are done are done correctly and are will lead to sort of bankable projects. Um, and yeah, there is again, there's a probably more space for yeah, like project preparation funding um, in in the Caribbean and, and really other places as well. So I think you know, leaning into that um, is probably a place where we can make a lot of progress. Okay, Alexa. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I echo some of the frustrations that I'm seeing in the chat, and certainly we can't um, kind of wait around for governments to catch up to to where we need to be to actually achieve a clean energy transition. Mm -hmm. I think some of the most um, successful partnerships that we've had with government have come from like co-creation processes where they're making capital available with a specific objective of mobilizing the private sector. And so an example of that would be you know, we have a technical assistance facility to um, develop pipeline in one specific country. And this, in this case, it's El Salvador. It's a, it's a relatively small country that we may not have been able to allocate a ton of resources to identifying projects. But with that partnership, and this, in this case, it was with USAID, um, you know, they said, what do we need to do to, to get more projects done in El Salvador? And we said, this is what you need to do. And then they, they resourced us to go and, and do that. And now, you know, six months later, we've got, you know, we found 35 projects. We're working with 10 nice. of them and we're going to invest in half of them. Right. So we know what, what works, but, you know, these sorts of mechanisms need to be made available and not all governments are, are doing that yet. But I, I really do think that blended finance is a powerful tool and um, and one that can kind of bring everyone's best to the forefront. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting, um, really interesting example, Alexa. And I think something that we could use in the OECS, where if we know how much it would take to completely 
you know, bring the pri- unlock the private capital, we can get some investors to the table who are willing to put in that investment to unlock the private capital. So I think um, that would be a great sort of entry point for us to take as an offline conversation in the OECS specifically to say how much money would it take to, to do that. Um, Stephen, oh. what are we doing differently? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. No, other, well, than, other than you're being appointed and starting up in September of last year, which is a whole new approach right. to Total, which, which, which helps. Yeah, you know, it certainly helps. And, you know, as I say, um, because normally, you know, an investor like Total Energies would probably bypass the Caribbean. But the good thing is that the company has really said that it, it wants to be active in each area where it's already active. Uh, to help with the energy transition. And so, so although the Caribbean is small, we do want to be uh, a, a significant player in getting to energy resilience and the energy transition. Um, but I understand the frustration that is being reflected in the Q&A because as, as I'm suggested, I feel the same sort of frustration because even before my uh, total energies uh, involvement, you know, I've been involved in the Jamaican energy space for a while. And, you know, Jamaica for a while was, you know, running along in, in terms of adding renewable energy, and then everything does grow to a halt. And, you know, that, you know, why, you know, we were doing well, well, and then, you know, it just sort of stopped. And now we have been waiting for years and years for the government to announce a new renewable energy tender. And so, you know, so I say that's my frustration. Why do we have to be waiting so long um, when we already know it can be done? You know, um, so we, you know, we will use our strength, our influence where it exists to try to get things to move along. But, but as I say, I do understand the frustration being expressed uh, in in a lot of the Q and A. <laughs> All right, and Andre. Yeah. So I mean. Um... I agree, you know, we will not wait for, for government. At the same time, we will get closer to the government or to governments um, in order to be able to influence their decision-making. So that's ap- absolutely something that we're working on and, and will continue to work on as well. Um, but I mean, really that's, that's what we're doing today, right? Is at Invert, we are, you know, we work with entrepreneurs, we work with companies, we work with people developing projects and we do it right from a concept, you know, through to implementation. So, you know, we'll help develop methodologies while, you know, funding the methodology development, um, designing the project documents, um, all the way to, you know, like I said, implementation or generating carbon offsets. And at the same time, we're developing technology to to facilitate crowdfunding or co-investment into projects so that people can uh, crowdfund or co-invest alongside us. So I think we're trying our best to do, to do what we can today. Um, and you know, I, I, um, I implore everyone on this call to, you know, to do something similar and, and ultimately not wait. All right, so a great question that we have. I wanna just start opening up for questions. Um, Laura McNeil is asking, please define early stage. And you know, that was the conversation that we were having. So (laughs) I definitely want, you know, what is early stage? Jamie, Alexa, Stephen, Andre, what is early stage? Tell me what is the earliest point at which you are able or willing to get involved in a project for the sake of clarity? Yeah, I I can jump in. I think what we... Yeah, everyone has their own definition here. So um, I think w- when we're talking about a, a company um, that we would consider taking under an advisory agreement, um, usually on like a donor funded mandate, probably not a commercial mandate. I think the earliest we, we would probably want, you know, two years of, of uh, financial information, audit, you know, usually audited financials, not always, but at least two years of audited financial information before we would be able to, to start working with them. Um, if it's a pure commercial mandate, then then probably more than that. Um, but that's that's one way I would define it. Okay, Alexa. 
Yeah, I mean, I think from a financing perspective, the the bifurcation is kind of like, is it project finance ready, right? Mm -hmm. So if if the project is now bankable, meaning that like a, a bank will come in and provide senior debt to the project, that's it's ready for project finance. And I think that's at the moment when there will be quite ready available of, of capital. And typically that means the project is ready to begin construction. So it's it's got um, land, it's got a PPA, it's got an EPC contract negotiated, it's got all of its permits in place, it's done its environmental and social mm-hmm. risk management. Um, so it's really ready to go, it's shovel ready. And anything before that is considered early stage. Wow, okay, yeah. Stephen, early yeah. stage. Okay, all right. Um, you know, and well, we are earlier than uh, Jamie and Alexa in that what we really want is a good concept and to be convinced that the project, you know, has a good chance of uh, becoming reality. Uh, so we don't need you to have spent a lot of money, but, you know, to the extent, though, that you, you know, one of the big issues in doing a project is land. Or is often land and so to the extent that you go you know you can say i have identified a project site um you know this is a project i want to do you know we expect that there will be you know a government tender coming up in the next year you know that there is an opportunity you know you can come and talk and we will help you uh to take you know that project forward um because we can invest and do some of the early stage development with you uh, in terms of actually moving it from more the conceptual stage to the bankable stage. But I think, you know, it varies, but the minimum first though is a solid project concept. You know, you must have a concept that makes sense and that we think, you know, we do see a path to the end, but we are willing to come in before the project is considered bankable. Fabulous. And Andre? Yeah, I would say very similar to Stephen actually, where and we generally look for, you know, what the what the concept is or for a concept note. Um, and, and really, it's about clearly identifying capital needs for the project um, within that, you know, some sort of financial model where we can understand expected returns. Um, a critical component to that is the team. So, you know, why are, mm. why is the team capable of developing this project? And of course, this project and, you know, the company or the team can absolutely be pre-revenue. So, um, you know, not revenue generating and, that, and that's okay. Um, and then I think finally they need to outline the risks of each of the projects and how they're planning to mitigate each of those risks so that um, investors can understand what risks are associated with that project and what the relative return should be for investing in that project. And then I think once you combine those things, and like Stephen said, of course, some understanding of land rights or ownership or, you know, how you plan to obtain uh, the land. I think once you combine those things, now you actually have an investable um, product or, or project. And, and so really, that's that's what we're looking for at Invert. You know what? I think that's such a, an amazing sort of um, timeline because we have everything from beginning to end in terms of, of of access to, to funding available here. Um, so we have far more questions on the Q&A and chat than we have time to address. However, what we will do is pull the chats and answer those questions in socials. So if you follow us on social and um, we, will, we will be answering those questions over the next uh, week. And yes, I see Janelle has just posted so that you can you can find more information from us, but absolutely um, new programs are happening every day. I think part of the issue is that people aren't aware of the projects that are available to help prepare projects or funding that's available to fund early stage programs. But once you get to a particular point, you have the ability to then uh, get to, to great sources of commercial funding that is presumably endless. Um, what we're seeing is 90% of finance is focused on mitigation. We definitely need to see far more focused on adaptation. And so, Andre, you know, even our panel sort of suggests 
you know, that so much is focused on, on mitigation and not enough on adaptation. And we definitely need to, to move into that direction. The one thing and thought that I can leave, leave you with on this panel is that there is something that each and every one of us can do. And so we can all sit and point fingers of, at government or who's not doing what, but at the end of the day, we all need to do something. And so um, if we all take ownership, then we must make progress. There's been tremendous progress across the region. Similar to that question that Judith answered about Dominica, I think we have a PR problem. Um, when we list countries that have 100% uh, renewable energy, you very rarely hear about Costa Rica when they're talking about globally how we're doing. And um, Jamaica's made tremendous progress in terms of meeting their nationally determined contributions and advancing them. The, the, the Dutch islands, uh, Aruba, Curacao, and Bonaire, have done tremendous things in terms of um, how they have defined their energy mix and are meeting those obligations. Barbados is a global leader in terms of solar water heaters. So we have lots of examples uh, to follow within the region. Bermuda, who's just joined the accelerator, um, is an example globally on, on independent water supply. And so there are many, many things that we are making progress on and that we are um, incrementally inching forward on. We're just not moving fast enough. And we are not in the region taking advantage of the opportunities that are presenting themselves. We want to lead the next, um, the next, few decades on climate resilience and how that is funded. And we can't, we can't take a backseat to that. We have to, to lead from the front. So I hope that, that all of you continue to engage, continue to fight, continue to lead from your own perspective. And I will, um, now we will close off this portion. I'm gonna hand over very, very briefly to Cheryl, and then we will head into the private fireside chat with Iman Musa of Credit Suisse. Thanks, Raquel. Um, we're just wrapping up our live stream. Those of you who are joining us on the Zoom platform, we encourage you to stay connected and to join us for the fireside chat. Next steps for our investor forum. We will follow up with our investors regarding their interest in the projects that were presented today. And we'll also follow up with our project leads in terms of their specific interests with any of the stakeholders who presented today. And if they have any projects that are in your pipeline that they also want to present. If you are in our audience and you are a project lead or a financier and you wish to participate in our investor forum, please contact us through our website, go to the Get Involved form, and submit your information to us. The Investor Forum is an ongoing initiative for the CCSA. This is the second in our series and we expect to be back with you again in about four months with another forum. As we wrap up this morning's event, we invite you to join us on social media, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can stay up to date and get alerts about upcoming events. Also look out for the recording of this session, which will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, those of you who posted questions in the chat that we may not have addressed, uh, we will come back to you specifically um, on queries about projects. But if you have a general query about contacting us and about the work that we do, please visit us, visit us on the website once again and go to that Get Involved form and we can provide you with some information. On behalf of the CCSA and the OECS, we thank everyone for joining us this morning. We acknowledge the participation of our esteemed panelists and speakers and we extend our sincere thanks to all of you and to your organizations for supporting us with this initiative. His Excellency Dr. Dilikus Jules, Director General of the OECS, Jamie McInerney, Head of Caribbean Advisory Cross Boundary, Alexa Blaine, Managing Partner of Deakin Impact, Stephen Wedderburn, Renewable Explorer, Total Energies Marketing, Jamaica Limited, and 
Andre Fernandez, co-founder and co-CEO of Invert Inc. Thank you so much. We also express our sincere thanks to our strategic partners and our supporting partners. Island Innovation for providing digital advertising for the event as well as technical support today. James, Christian, Vincent and the entire team the team at the OECF, the admin team, the communications, as well as the project team for joining us today and supporting us with the data gathering and planning, specifically Nadej, Lisa, Lucy Jean, and everyone else. And finally, to the CCSA team, Raquel, Keisha, who did a lot of the background work, but is currently away at the conference and probably still joining us. And Janelle, our digital impact specialist who provided technical support as well as planning and coordination for the event. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us for the live stream. I do stay connected, everyone on Zoom, for our fireside chat with Iman Musa of Credit Suisse. All right, thank you guys so much. And we're also on TikTok, y'all. So um, we, are, we are also quite hip and new <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the solutions. And thank you, Cheryl, for, for um, Cheryl did so much of this work while on supposedly holiday, which is we've been calling it the non-holiday holiday because she was connected the entire time, which is not our intent for her at all. But thank you so much. So 